there's this w- one piece, which is IQ itself, having nothing to do with race, has been a somewhat taboo topic, particularly on the left politically. But what's interesting is that it wasn't always the case because the left used to be kind of boosterish about IQ testing because it seemed to promise a direct road to meritocracy. It would get us yeah. out of cl- these class differences and people could just be judged on their own merits. That's why the SAT was invented. The SAT was uh, was going to be, and in fact, it did serve this function. It would be a way for kids who did not go to Groton and uh, Exeter and the rest of it to, to uh, get a chance to show how smart they were. And they could be brought into the colleges and Harvard in particular and its Conant, its president back in the 1940s, were very hot on using tests for precisely that purpose. And by the way, uh, I went to Harvard in 1961, which pretty well dates me, uh, from from Newton, Iowa. And uh, I was absolutely convinced that I got in because I was able to take an SAT score and get a good score, even though I went to a mediocre public school. Sorry about that, Newton High School. Uh, and, And in that sense, the enthusiasm for IQ is appropriate insofar as it's a good way to identify intellectual talent. But at this point, Sam, it's almost as if we are in the opposite position of conventional wisdom versus elite wisdom that we were, say, when Columbus was going to sail to America. When, when Columbus was going to sail to America, it is true that an awful lot of the ordinary people still thought that the earth was flat. But among the elites, it was understood that the earth is round. Well, now it is ordinary people are perfectly comfortable with the idea that some people are smarter than others. They're perfectly comfortable that 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 what we call smart uh, gets you kinds of jobs that you can't get otherwise, all that kind of stuff. Mm. It's the elites who are under the impression that, oh, IQ tests only measure what IQ tests measure, and nobody really is able to define intelligence. And this and that, they're, they're culturally biased, on and on and on and on. And all of these things are the equivalent of saying the earth is flat. These are not opinions that you can hold in, in contest with the scientific literature any more than you can be an Aristotelian physicist uh, in contradistinction to a Newtonian physicist. This stuff is not subject to debate anymore. Yeah. But the, conv- the elite wisdom now in colleges is, and a lot of your listeners are saying that what I'm saying is pseudoscience. It's it very frustrating. Yeah, you just referenced two things which are, I think are widely believed, which are certainly known to be false and, and were known to be false at the time you wrote your book, again, more than 20 years ago. And the, f- the first claim is that IQ tests simply measure people's ability to take IQ tests. Yeah. That is a shibboleth that is, is rattling around the brains of certainly many of our listeners. No one in touch with the literature has thought that was true for a generation. And then there's the idea that these tests are well known to be culturally biased so that you just cannot get valid data on certain groups. And and, and this is something we've never been able to overcome. That also is not the current opinion of psychometricians anywhere. Is that is that correct? Yeah. And, and let's let me describe a little bit why we know those two things uh, in terms of why we know that IQ tests measure something other than the ability to take IQ tests. It's a matter of predictive validity. And predictive validity means that if you take a population with who have IQ scores and then you take a uh, their their history on a variety of things of interest, such as income or job productivity or the rest of it, the IQ scores predict this outcome. So they predict income in terms of employment decisions for job productivity. You are better off if you're an employer and you have only one datum that you can get you can't t- you can't have two you are better off knowing an iq score than you are having a personal interview having grades having degrees or anything else the, the single most informative thing you can have is an iq score this is not the result of a one or two studies the the predictive validity of iq tests has been established over and over 
Cultural bias, you basically have a couple of, of ways to test for cultural bias. One of them is, is there a racial difference in the predictive validity of the tests? So let's say that the SAT were culturally biased. What that says is the SAT doesn't capture this thing called academic ability to succeed in college as well for blacks as it does for whites. Or it could just systematically underestimate the ability of blacks relative to whites. And what then will be the result? The result will be that if you let people in who have the lower IQ scores or the lower SAT scores, they'll actually do better than the test score predicted. The test will have underpredicted their performance. That has been tested with a, an extensive literature. There is absolutely no evidence whatsoever that test scores, whether IQ tests or SAT, underpredict black performance. There is some evidence that they may overpredict black performance, but that that raises a whole different set of issues and problematic issues. But the tests are not biased against blacks in terms of predictive validity. The way that most people think about cultural bias, though, is in items that a white upper middle class kid is more likely to know the answer to than than a black inner city kid. And the poster child for this was an SAT item that used analogies, and it in one of them involved the word regatta as uh, part of the uh, answer. And of course, people dumped on that saying, look, who, who's going to know what regatta means? Well, th there's, a, there's a very direct way that you can deal with that. You can do item analysis of the tests so that you can, for example, have people simply inspect the items and rate them according to their cultural loading. That would be one approach. And then you can extract those items and see whether test scores converge. Or you can see whether uh, the items that are culturally loaded are harder for, for black students to answer than they are for white students. And the answer to the, those questions is no, that the ordering of difficulty of items is the same across races. And that when you have tests that are empty of any cultural loading at all, that it is not that the, the black-white difference diminishes. Uh, it doesn't. Sometimes it gets greater because it, in this is a more complicated statement. There's more complicated literature. But there is some evidence that the culturally loaded items are ones that, that minority groups do better on than the purely abstract ones. Mm. So in other words, th th when you say the tests are culturally biased, you are not forced to sort of sit back and stare at the ceiling and decide whether they are on the basis of your intuition. There are very systematic ways to interrogate the quality of the tests with regard to this. And th modern tests pass with flying colors. Well, now we're getting closer to the the rods at the core of the reactor here. Let, let's talk about the concept of race. It, it's also widely believed that race is not a valid biological concept. It's a, a social construct. This is, in many ways, to see this is untrue, but there's a kernel of truth here, which is that it's a, it's a biological concept, but it is, is a blurry one. I mean, it, it's, it's yeah. similar to the way, I mean, race is Races can be thought of uh, as analogous to families. In fact, some people have said that, that a race is essentially just a very large family that is partly inbred. But you can see family resemblance in the races. I mean, this is, it's not an accident that you can generally predict where a person's ancestors came from by just simply looking at his face, right? I mean, there, there, there are phenotypic differences between people that have genetic underpinnings and it's not merely just skin deep. I mean, there are genetic diseases that various racial groups have or are more prone to, you know, Tay-Sachs, sickle cell anemia, and this is just straight biology. And, and right. because different racial groups differ genetically to any degree, and because most of what we care about in ourselves, intelligence included, because most of what we care about in ourselves also it has some genetic underpinnings. For many of these traits, we're talking about something like 50%. It would be very, very surprising if everything we cared about was tuned 
to the exact same population average in every racial group. I mean, there's just virtually no way that's going to be true. So based purely on biological consideration, we should expect that for any variable, there will be differences in the average, its average level across mm -hmm. racial groups that, that differ genetically to some degree. There's, there's a, a branch point here in the conversation, which is that one thing that has changed dramatically since the time that Dick and I were working on the bell curve, we published it in 94, which meant we were basically writing it from 1990 uh, up to 94. Hmm. The thing that has changed most dramatically is now that the genome has been sequenced and uh, so much has been learned since it has been sequenced. The whole discussion of uh, ethnicity slash race is being conducted at a much higher level of sophistication. At the time we were working on the bell curve, you know, they would look at blood groups and things like this to try to have something besides phenotypic characteristics, uh, hmm. facial characteristics and, and skin color. Now, the, well, the ability of the geneticist to simply uh, look at variation over a million SNPs <laughs> across populations and do really fascinating uh, cluster analysis. Yeah, yeah polygenetic analysis. Yeah. Just the, the whole conversation about uh, the word populations is what the geneticists like to use now instead of race, and I don't blame them. And I, I'm happy talking about populations, too. That's, that's just being done at a huge level that we never considered. In the bell curve, we simply said, if people call themselves black or Latino or white, we're going to believe them and we're, there are going to be our samples. But here's the point going forward in this conversation, Sam, which is the blurriness of race is noise in the signal. It, the blurriness of race is not going to to artificially make it look as if there are genetic differences in IQ, it's right. going to obscure any such uh, genetic differences in IQ. So, so in effect, we are looking at a noisy signal, and if you still see patterns in the data that point to the possibility of genetic roles, those signals have survived uh, a lot of contamination. But again, I mean, we, what we need, what we should come back to here is that. Genes are, are almost certainly only just part of the story, and there should be very likely an environmental contribution here. And this is something you say in your book many, many times. Let's, let's go back to the, do the same thing with um, genes and IQ and race that, that we did with, um, with cultural bias in the tests. And the, do the tests measure anything except uh, the ability to take tests? We are not helpless to simply say, well, there's still racism existing, so that must be the explanation. There are lots of ways that we can look at patterns in the data and say, well, are these compatible with an exclusively environmental explanation? And I want to stress that last point. Dick and I, our, our crime in the book was to have a single solitary paragraph that said, after talking about the patterns that I'm about to describe, if we've convinced you that either the environmental or the genetic explanation has one out to the exclusion of the other, we haven't done a good enough job of presenting the evidence for one side or the other. It seems to us highly likely that both genes and the environment have something to do with racial differences. And go, we went no farther than that. There is an asymmetry between saying Probably genes have some involvement and the assertion that it's entirely environmental. And that's what the that's the assertion that is being made. If you're going to be upset at the bell curve, you are obligated to defend the proposition that the black white difference in IQ scores is 100 percent environmental. And that's a very tough measure. Here's the way that we went about it. So we are now, how did you put it a while ago, the, the radioactive rods were getting closer to yes, you. Yeah. Here's the, the thinking that Dick and I had that led us to write that sentence. And it starts out with simply the, the very high demands that the environmental hypothesis places on you. If you say for purposes of just thinking through the arithmetic that, that genes uh, and, and environment 
it's a 50-50 split in explaining uh, variants of an IQ in a whole population. That means that in order for the environment to explain 100% of a standard deviation difference mean between blacks and whites, the average black would have to be in an environment that is about 1.5 standard deviations below the white mean. That's a really big difference. And if you take all of the measures like income and educational attainment and occupational distribution and a variety of other measures of, of uh, environment, uh, one and a half standard deviations is way, way bigger than any of the observed differences are there. That doesn't mean that there are unme- aren't unmeasured differences in the environment that are also at work. It just is you start off with a really big question in your mind, is that plausible that it can be 100% environmental? Well, I think we should add here that it is possibly plausible when you bring in the Flynn effect in the sense that, so so the Flynn, we, I don't think we've defined the Flynn effect. We but, haven't even talked about yeah, the Flynn effect yet. But, but J- James Flynn, who I, the, the, you have actually, as far as I can tell, in, in the bell curve, you're the one who brought attention to the Flynn effect, James. We named the Flynn effect. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. you named it after James Flynn, who James has, Flynn. who's done James this Flynn, this yeah. research. So tell us what the Flynn effect is. The Flynn effect is the. It was noted also by a guy named uh, Richard Lynn, who is uh, one of the the people that uh, I'm excoriated with for citing in the bell curve as being an out-and-out racist. But uh, Richard Lynn had also identified this in East Asian tests. And Jim Flynn identified it and brought it. He did more than Lynn did to bring it to public attention. Namely, IQ tests are renormed every time they have a new edition. So if you have the Wexler, and let's say they had a, a uh, norming in 1950, they norm it to a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. What Flynn noticed was that if you give that same test to a set of people in 1960 instead of 1950, the mean is not 100, it's 102 or maybe 103. So that over the course of the 10 years, it's that the IQ scores of the population have risen. And as he looked at that, he found the Flynn effect, this secular increase in IQ scores going back to the 1940s and 1930s and extending out uh, into recent data. And the implications of this have just driven scholars crazy uh, since then and the causes of it. because. There are no, even after this much time, there's still a lot that's not understood. Is it simply a matter of increasing of exposure to things which let you answer IQ questions? An example, one of the kinds of IQ questions is uh, rotating mentally in your mind's eye an object in three dimensions and being able to say something about how it looked when you look at it from the other side. Those are items which, which I think I did very poorly on, by the way. Well, you know, the, the ability of people to answer that question is going to be different in 1930 when nobody sees routinely objects rotating in three dimensions in front of your eyes than in 2017 where every television commercial is having, you know, script and other things rotating in three dimensions as part of our daily lives. So it could be that kind of, of simply modernity and sensitization to certain kinds of uh, mental tasks that we weren't sensitized to before. Hmm. Could it also be an increase in G? Might be. Uh, there, there are some reasons to believe in the analysis of test scores that it could be partly that, but not a lot. That, I think, is probably a fair characterization of the state of knowledge right now. Is improved nutrition a thesis there or not? And improved nutrition could well be a contributor. Improved nutrition does enhance IQ. Although you would think you think you would hit the ceiling long before the better part of a century, because yeah, nutrition yeah, is yeah. probably where it needs to be now. And, 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 and there's also, by the way, there has been direct analysis of the nature of the. We're talking very complicated statistics at this point. But the nature of uh, the difference between blacks and whites and IQ scores and the subtests and the nature of the Flynn effect as analyzed by subtests and the scholars who did that, who are uh, Dutch scholars, 
Jelty Wichards, uh, W-I-C-H-A-R-T-S, is the lead author of one of the most important articles in this. Their conclusion is that the nature of the Flynn effect is pretty much divorced from the nature of the black-white difference. But the Flynn effect itself is a fascinating phenomenon, and it's a reminder that, that we don't know everything there is to know about all this stuff. Right. Well, well, that's interesting because I have here a quote from Flynn. I don't know when he wrote this or said this, but he says, um, quote, an environmental explanation of the racial IQ gap need only posit this, that the average environment for blacks in 1995 matches the quality of the average environment for whites in 1945. I do not find that implausible, end quote. So what you just said seems to close the door to that interpretation of the, of the black-white gap. Yes, it does. And this is a case where I am citing someone who has done analyses that are at a level of complexity that I'm not independently competent to pronounce. Uh, this, is a very, this is a top scholar who did that, and he had some co-authors whose names I don't recall off the top of my head. He's a top scholar. Uh, He does really rigorous work. But that's all I can say at this point. So I want to just now drive to the ethical and political punchline, which is a point you emphasize in your book, it really as as scrupulously as you could, and it did not spare you all of the the pain that uh, you subsequently suffered. and, And perhaps it won't spare us the pain for having this conversation. But this really is the takeaway message, and again, it's the message you took away more than 20 years ago, which is whatever their origin, mean IQ differences are not all we care about. And so we we, we care about ethics and politics, and we we want societies that maximize human well-being. And for this, we need political equality. And to have political equality, you have to treat people as individuals. It's ethically and it's politically prudent to do this. And, and here's a crucial point. It's also rational to do this because that the differences between groups are not so large that there isn't a substantial overlap between them for every trait we care about. So, that, so and, and given that the, the variance between individuals will be much higher than, than the variance between groups, again, for any trait we care about, but especially what we're talking now about intelligence, It would actually be irrational to read much into group differences. So the the truth the truth is, I learn nothing about a person's intelligence simply by being told that he's black or white or Asian. You still need to treat people as as individuals, and and you you make it absolutely clear in your book that given the overlap in, in these bell curves, there will be many, many blacks who are far more intelligent than most whites. I mean, so this is, is a, again, it all comes back down to honestly evaluating individuals. I, I emphatically agree with everything you've just said. As you pointed out, Nick and I have some of these passages in italics in the book. One of them we have not stressed enough is that there's much more variation uh, within groups uh, than there is between, I mean, the separation is much, much greater within groups than it is between groups, so that the overlap is very large. But think of it in terms of being an employer. And you're trying to hire, you need a really smart uh, uh, guy for a job, and Barack Obama walks in to the interview. Okay, he's black. If you then make inferences about how smart he is based on uh, his membership in a an ethnic group, you are going to be making a huge mistake. And the same thing is true for not just employers. It's, it's, it's true for admitting people to schools. It is true for all of our interactions with other people. We do not know whether they are people who we would like to hang out with. We don't know how smart they are. We don't know how uh, much integrity they have by looking at them and assigning them a group membership, whether, by the way, it's not just race, but it's also sex and it's sexual orientation and it's ethnicity of a much more detailed form, any group you want to name, you don't know on the basis of group means what you're dealing with. It, It is virtually impossible to make that point stick. Again, you made that point with absolute clarity in the book. 
I mean, I just read the, mo- the most controversial sections of the book, you know, last night, just to assure myself of this. And you make that point repeatedly. But I mean, to give people a taste of the reaction you got to this book, the, the sociologist Stephen Rosenthal called the book, quote, a vehicle of Nazi propaganda wrapped in a cover of pseudoscientific respectability, an academic version of Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf. Right. I mean, th- th- this was the tenor of the response, even among intellectuals and academics who were reviewing the book. Yep. When we wrote the chapter, we spent a lot of time in this chapter with with trying to to get it right, not just in the technical details, but also in the language. And when we were all done with it, I actually had these hopes that when the book came out that Dick and I would be applauded for having taken this inflammatory issue and treated it and saying, this is not such a big deal. Uh, this is nothing to get excited about, but it's something that it's better to, to look at than for people to have these way exaggerated notions of what might be going on. I thought we might get some kudos for that. <laughs> and it turned out that people who, I know of academics, especially, who actually read the book had to know they were lying. Because I'm thinking of specific academics, they just simply know too much about this subject not to have known that they were lying. And they lied without any apparent shadow of uh, guilt, because I guess in their own minds, they were doing the Lord's work. Yeah, it was a kind of moral panic. I mean, when you you look at just how irrational the claims were. I mean, you're talking about claims that intelligence doesn't exist on some level or that it doesn't matter or that you can't possibly test for it or that there can't possibly be differences, among, mean differences among groups or that it could have no genetic underpinnings. I mean, this is like they were throwing out a century of our growing understanding of these things and vilifying you with an energy that clearly this is what happens when you touch a taboo in this way. I guess that one thing that must be occurring to our listeners now, and, and this, is one, this is my misgiving about having this conversation and, and, and going into this area at all, is the question is, why talk about any of this? Why seek data on racial difference at all? What is the purpose of doing this? Because we now have social policy embedded in employment policy, in academic uh, policy, which is based on the premise that everybody's equal above the neck. All groups should be equal above the neck, whether it's men and women or whether it's ethnicities. And when you have that embedded into law, you have a variety of bad things happen. Let's go back to the employer who uh, sees Barack Obama walk into the office for a job interview And I'm saying for him to treat Barack Obama as the member of a group, as opposed to the man sitting across the desk, is idiotic, as well as being immoral. Mm. What social policy is doing in an employer's mind when it is a black candidate walking into that office is all sorts of things that are raising the cost of hiring that person, that employer, raising the cost in terms of vulnerability to uh, discrimination lawsuits, vulnerability to a variety of other regulatory penalties, because all at once that person, that person cannot be evaluated on that person's merits and the decision made solely on those merits without incurring risks. Because if you treat all of your employees really equally, If you fire them for exactly the same reasons or refuse to promote them for exactly the same reasons, but those reasons, as all such reasons, don't lend themselves to ironclad proof, you're you're, you're having to take a chance. But let me give you, there's a whole bunch of other reasons. And, And now I want to expand it beyond ethnic differences to gender differences. You know, there are, there's a strong argument to be made that my colleague at AEI Uh, Christina Hoff Summers has made, that education in recent years has been taken over by uh, essentially an elite wisdom which has feminized education and changed K-12 education in ways which boys don't thrive in and girls do. 
And the answer to that is not to go back into an old form of education, which uh, was based on how boys learn. Rather, it's important to recognize differences between men and women, boys and girls that exist, to do a good job of educating them. Throughout the way that we conduct our economic and educational lives and a lot of other institutions, the equality premise that all groups of people only have differences in outcomes because of racism or sexism or inappropriate institutions, that assumption has created huge harm. But now but to take the flip side of that, whether you acknowledge it now or just in the past, at, what, at one point there was a place for affirmative action and other course attempts to promote diversity. Do you think that was a mistake from the beginning or do you think it's a mistake now or, what, or how do you think about overcoming the challenge of the lack of diversity and the, kind of the attendant stratification of society there? The, the original sense of affirmative action for about the first 12 months after the term came into use was that if you were an employer, you should make greater efforts to reach out to uh, applicant pools that you wouldn't have otherwise reached out to, and that you would take affirmative action to bring people in that, that had been excluded. And had people been excluded, uh, whether women or blacks or other minorities, absolutely. Was there a need for affirmative action to remedy to that? Yes, there was. But at the same time that you did that, and, and you needed to do this on, on the basis of, of what's good for the people you're trying to help, it needed to be one which did not put people into places where they were set up to fail. The, one of the great scandals that nobody talks about in elite schools is the dropout rates of their minority students. All of the kids who get into MIT, and by the way, I do not have, I, I know about dropout rates uh, some years ago for MIT. I don't know recent ones. Mm. But I know that there was a time at which uh, the dropout rate among black students at MIT was about 24%. Now, to get into MIT, you are going to be in the top 1% or 2 3% of, uh, of mathematical ability. Maybe let's say everybody's within the top 5%. You're going to be very smart in math. But if you are let in, and let's say you're at the fourth percentile in math ability, and you are in engineering classes with your fellow students at MIT, the rest of the students in that class are in the top one-tenth of 1%, sometimes in the top one, one-hundredth of the top percent. And in that kind of setting, you are the dumbest kid in the class. There is no reason for 24% of those kids not to be highly successful at really good colleges. Mm. MIT is probably not the place for them because, because of the mismatch. So I, I, I feel like the, some of the numbers came out uh, wrong there. I just, so I just want to make, make sure I'm tracking what you're saying. So you're saying All that- black kids are really smart. But there, there's a huge difference- between being in the top one tenth of one percent mathematically when you're in an engineering class at MIT and being in the ninety fifth percentile mathematically. Right, right. Uh, that's that's what I was trying to say. But yes. I would appeal to people who are listening to this who have had that kind of experience, uh, particularly those of you who have been in classes and you know you're pretty smart, but you've been in classes who you also know that the other kids in there are a lot smarter than you are. That can be demoralizing experience. And imagine that's true of every class you go to. By the way, there is a literature that has gone both ways on this issue. And, and for the first time this afternoon, I will say I am on one side of a contested literature where there are data that can be cited by both sides. There, are, there have been books written that said, no, this mismatch does not produce the... Uh, all the bad results that I've just claimed, or even if it does produce some of those, there are other advantages to it. So I want to acknowledge the existence of that alternative mm -hmm. argument. Just to come back to my original question here. So the reason why I wanted to have this conversation with you about race and IQ and about the, the bell curve is 
I perceive a huge intellectual and moral injustice with respect to how you were treated on this topic, because everything you have said about it has been as judicious and as clear-headed ethically as I would hope it would be. And you were treated like, I mean, you, you know, you got to attend your own witch burning uh, and have for the last 20 years. So that's, that's why I'm kind of wading into this morass with you. But I'm still conflicted over this issue of why study this topic at all, because it's very easy to see that why anyone would assume that if you're looking in an area that is producing invidious comparisons between races, and you're continuing to look in that area and continuing to be interested in that area, your interest must be motivated to some degree by a kind of morbid and quasi-racist curiosity in just sort of kind of shoring up a notion of difference between white and black in this case. Uh, and needless to say, you, you, I'm, I'm sure we can find you know, white supremacist organizations who absolutely love the fact that the bell curve was published and just admonish their members to read it at the, at the first opportunity. Why look at this? How does this help society for us to be getting more information about racial difference? If you go back to some of my earliest published stuff uh, on, on affirmative action, you can go back to 1984 when I did an article for the New Republic in which I was talking about the mismatch problem. And a lot of that is, how would I feel if I were a black kid my age uh, going into college and everybody thought I was there because I was an affirmative action kid? I would hate that. I would really hate it. How would I feel if on the job... I knew that everybody assumed I got that job because of affirmative action. I would hate that. And I would try to do my best to, to prove them wrong, but I find that morally repugnant. Mm. And, and so, but a lot of it was, was, I think, a kind of empathy with, what if I were me, but I was in the same way in personality and intellect and everything else and ambitions. But what if I were black living in this world right now? And I'll tell you something else I went back to. When I got to Harvard in the fall of 1961, there were way fewer black uh, students, undergraduates than there are now, way fewer. But I will tell you, this was pre-affirmative action, pre-Civil Rights Act of 1964 for that matter. The kid from Newton, Iowa, every time he saw a black face uh, at the student union or whatever, my instinctive reaction was, he's probably smarter than I am. And I made that assumption because I figured that the, the black kids are very likely to have had a tougher road to hoe than I had to get there. So that was, I didn't think about that a lot. I wasn't mm -hmm. obsessed with it. it. It was just my natural reaction. And in subsequent years, by the early 1980s, I was thinking about that way of thinking about my fellow students and the way that I knew that things were going on in the university because I had enough faculty members and enough friends who had children in college to know what was going on. And I'm saying to myself, this is way worse. And for that matter, I had been tutoring on a volunteer basis in the early 80s, uh, kids in the inner city, black kids in the inner city, in the uh, what's called the Higher Achievement Program. The program is run by the Catholic Church. I'm not Catholic, but the program wasn't limited to Catholics. It took the smartest kids from the inner city public schools and had them do intensive tutoring a couple of times a week. And so I tutored those classes. And it, this was not uh, touchy-feely tutoring. This is really high-paced stuff. And these were great kids. And they were, they were coming in. They were attending. They were working hard. Everything was going right. And one of the things that just stuck out was the degree to which all of these attempts at affirmative action in its new form were creating an atmosphere in which it made it harder for these kids to succeed, not easier. So I said, I said a few minutes ago that when it comes to what I see as the harms done by social policy, that I am taking one side in an argument that is still legitimately contested. 
Uh, and all I can say is I am taking it on the basis not just of statistics in books, but personal experiences I have had where I think we are doing enormous harm to young people by making it harder to treat them as individuals.